What's up, guys, and how's it going? Welcome back to the Bad Days Podcast. I'm here with Isaiah. Wait, that's not that's not Isaiah, and this isn't the usual setup. We don't have mics in our hands. That's Mr. Brad Lambert, the one and only. Brad, how are you doing today? What's up, Hassan? How are you, man? Thanks for having me. Doing fantastic. Dude, I'm excited to have you guys. So a little background for those of you who don't know who Brad is. Brad is, I think at one point he was called the uh, the Hollywood manager of the stars, right? Like you were able to like make dreams happen. Uh, Brad uh, worked at Robert Downey Jr.'s team for years over there, Team Downey, and then he moved to Warner Brothers, and then he decided to take a different career track and working with content creators. And he did some amazing work taking some – some household names that we know in the comic book and stream and you know TikTok community and bringing them like they they're only household names because of Brad not to not to dismiss their talent or their tenacity or their ability to put out content I had, a, I had a little impact yeah, yeah. but you know uh, the difference between a creator who's able to have millions of followers and millions of eyes on them at all times and still not be able to go to a movie premiere versus a guy who's in his living room making stuff on just an iPhone, nothing else, no equipment, no glam, nothing, but can go stand next to, you know, Robert Downey Jr. Or interview Ethan Hawke or whoever, you know. That's that's pretty astounding that you were able to do that. And that's kind of the conversation me and Brad wanted to have. You know, it's a bad day's conversation because uh, here's the the little nitty gritty backstory. And we're going to get into this a lot more. I've, but, I've had a few bad days. Recently, yeah, so <laughs> he's we, had some bad we, days. We can make it work. <laughs> we can we can figure it out. But but mo most recently, uh, Brad had a uh, a falling out of sorts. I wouldn't even call it that with a creator that he helped build from the ground up. And uh, this podcast, you know, we, we're about candor, and I think it's worth telling the story start to finish. So I will name the creator. I'm not, I'm not pushing hate, and I'm going to go ahead and stress to you guys. No anybody, anybody who listens to Bad Days, you don't need to go harass this person. I think that they'll get what's coming to them. Uh, hopefully they own up and they grow up from this, and then they go on to have a wonderful, beautiful, thriving career. We have lots of mutual friends, so like literally no hate their way, but the situation was handled pretty poorly in my opinion. But we'll talk about it. The creator's name is Soups. You'll know him from the many memes on TikTok from the Spider-Man No way home to the, you know the smash cut of those clips to just in general having kind of goofier takes and more eccentric opinions on marvel tv shows and stuff like that so he's kind of the poster boy for the superhero community over on tiktok and uh brad found aside him from aside from straw hat goofy of course right straw hat goofy is the other one and straw hat goofy has actually he's managed actually bigger like let, let's be real let's be honest uh, Ju juju's a good friend of mine straw hat goofy and his yeah. his Same. Uh, his career path has been far more let me be your movie guy and it lended yeah. himself to having a lot more opportunities such as most recently he got COVID and wasn't able to do it but he was actually hosting Pixar's Lightyear premiere with another Amazing. creator named Jay Stoops which is you know we can applaud that that's incredible but Stoops is in the same realm as that uh, and Brad found him when he was just starting out his content creation career can you give some context to like how many followers Stoops had at the time yeah or? I mean look uh, he had a platform that that that's not a uh, I don't want to get it twisted. He he had I think close to a million when I wow. found him. Uh, so his his platform was great. Um, he wasn't verified. You know I I found him as a fan and and we kind of bonded as friends. Um, but I was able to get him verified on TikTok relatively quickly after first connecting with him. Uh, I didn't ask for anything. I just believed in him and I wanted to to help him. And I did in like five hours. And I think you've had a similar experience with me in that regard. <laughs> yeah, uh, man. TikTok, mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, and you guys do know, you guys watch this podcast. You've seen my Instagram. TikTok just deletes my account at random. <laughs> and uh, shoot, if Soups didn't do what he did, hopefully Brad could have called in a chip and got me my blue check mark of safety. But oh, we'll get into all of that because I, I wish I, we would have connected back then. Bro, I would love to just talk about easy. Well, it's the cascading effects. I think that is such an interesting conversation of like he thought this the, – the, the thing that he did to you, which we'll get into, was just going to affect you. But in turn, it affected so many creators and so many different individuals and really changed the, tra the trajectory of a lot of their careers. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that. But you and Soups met. You, you bonded over a passion for, for superhero content for everything, yeah. which is great because, you know, like, honestly, I bet I could sit down with the guy, have a beer, and have quite a few great conversations about the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a 100%. fan, too, you know, uh, but you guys connected on that. And as a fan also, I was watching this from the outside in during that same time period. Soups was getting close to, to one million. I was getting close to four, but uh, <laughs> he was meeting you, and I remember immediately seeing 
Brad Lambert and going through your your Instagram, like, oh my God, Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. again? Like, like you knew Robert Downey Jr. You you had the the uh, pleasure of working on his team, like the honor of working with this incredible group of people and stuff like that. And now you're working with creators. I was so interested. Immediately, I was like writing up a DM of like, how do I court this guy? I did actually send you a DM that I unsent because I was embarrassed about it. So I don't think I've ever told you that. I did hit oh, send man. on a DM and I was like, he's going to look at my page and see that I'm just the Mickey Mouse guy and this conversation is going to not be what oh, I want it to that. be. So never I, that. I unsent. So if you ever had a notification in the, like, in the October area, the October to September area, I had – and it just said, user has unsent message. That was yeah. me <laughs> unsending my message to you. Uh, greatest regret of my life now because now I have one of, like, I don't know, my favorite people in the world, one of my best friends. And uh, I wish I could have had it a couple months earlier. That would have been awesome. Hey, man, uh, everything happens for a reason, and, and things happen when they're supposed to. So um, I, I'm just glad to to have you in my life now. And uh, I am I just I love meeting people. So, like, I there is no ego here. I, I don't care. I mean, I, I want to just meet good people and work with good people, and hopefully we can work together and win together. That's always been my goal. Yeah. No, that's always been the narrative. I mean, the moment I met you, I think that was abundantly clear. And to all the people that I know that have personally interacted with you, interacted with you, and then were capable of hopping on the phone with me to give me a call, they were all so adamant that you were a great guy. The people who made a lot of accusations and allegations, they knew about me. I had requested from several of our mutual friends, like, hey, could you hit up Soups, who's involved in this article? And and well, well we got to get to the article first, and we'll get to that part. But yeah, yeah. So, so Brad and Soups had this great friendship relationship. Soups. Uh, Matt Ramos would bring Brad in onto into videos with him because they're friends, which that is in my eyes far more of a collaboration than it is any anything else. Correct. Because I don't know about you guys, but I have friends that have been on every other episode of the Bad Days podcast, and they don't get a check. I'm the only one who gets a check because, and, and honestly, it's not really a check. This podcast doesn't make money yet, but you know what? If it does, it's mine. They're here to hang out, and they're happy to hang out and be a part of the process. And, and, and they choose to do that. They do, and at no point am I gonna. Are they ever gonna say anything to me about you used us for our fame or our platform? I've had friends on bad days who have millions and millions and millions of followers. I had a friend who's Charlie D'Amelio's like former high school best friend. The lost episode of Bad Days, no one ever did get to see that because <laughs> I lost all of her audio. Her name's Quinn. She's lovely, lovely human being. Her and Charlie just went to prom like a week and a half ago together. It's crazy to get a Snapchat awesome. with uh, Charlie D'Amelio in the background. And like, that's not the primary focus, like the most famous girl in the world technically. But um, yeah, we, we've we had people on here and no one ever is like, you're using me for my fame. We're using you to have a nuanced conversation or to provide, to add value. That is what collaboration is as a whole. So Brad was, collab like right now he is a collaborator on Bad Days. Am I excited to elevate the fuck out of this story? Of course I am. But he's a collaborator here. And Brad, don't expect a check from this episode. <laughs> what? What? Uh, Hassan. Yeah, don't you're expect You're using me. Of course, man. <laughs> <laughs> but that became that became the spin narrative, right? They built this friendship, and Matt was known for every single every other day. There was a video on his page saying, "My best friend Brad Lambert and I," and then he would talk about like what you guys were doing together, and that you'd have the newbie deal, and that you were gonna be at the movies, and and it was it was really heartwarming at the time. He called you his best friend through and through. He's my little brother, man. Thank yeah. you straight up. I like, mean, I think you told me this later. You guys even had gone on like a family vacation together. Like you took him with yeah, your I, family. I, yeah, I took him to my family uh, vacation to Hawaii in August, and then shit hit the fan in November. Yeah. So that's which crazy. Which, to me, I think that that takes a, another level of – that broke my heart in another way because I, I – for me, my family is a very personal, private thing. Even on the internet, I don't divulge too much of what goes on outside of like the comedic abuse stories and whatnot. But I don't, I don't like to talk about the nitty gritty and the nuances and the day to days. And I, and I rarely ever bring somebody from my life as a creator into my normal personal life. So for you to have done that, take him as far as to go on your family. He probably knows your mom. He probably knows your sister, your dad. He's probably Everybody. friends with them. Yeah. And then for him to turn around and do what he did. And what he did was in November, him and Brad had a conversation that, uh, Brad decided, as he should as a manager, to give him some constructive criticism. When I first met Brad, he frankly told me, he goes, I think you're funny. I think you're talented. I think you're charismatic. I think you're great on camera. But all your presence right now is Mickey Mouse, and that puts a wrench in a lot of things you want to work towards. Don't get rid of Mickey because you love it and your fans love it. 
but you need to leverage more of you in videos. And if you guys take a look at my online presence in the six months since, it'll reflect that exact sentence. And it did make a world of a difference in my career. The opportunities that I was presented with skyrocketed. And no, I'm still not making millions of dollars in brand deals, but I'm well on my way to starting that journey that I wasn't because I was behind a puppet. And it was constructive criticism. It hurt to hear to have to have this discussion of like this thing that I've built for months and months and months. Well, I'm stuck. Like I won't be able to grow it. Yeah. But it was something that I needed to hear. And it was a constructive conversation. Brad had something similar with soups. And his response to that conversation was, I'm not going to speak to you anymore. Right? He, uh, he cut and you off. I'm going to try to destroy your life. Like it, it was – the, here's the thing I'll say, man. I'm not a yes man. I'm not an, an enabler. I'm not going to gas you up to the point of delusions. I pride myself on being someone who's super supportive. Uh, I want to make people feel seen, heard, loved, appreciated, supported. Um, you know, and, and I think that's really important, especially in the world we're in today where, you know, I find it hilarious how – uh, it's hilarious and yet devastating how there's never a line of people out the door who's showing love to you. Mm -hmm. But the second somebody says one negative-ish thing about you, people come out of the woodwork and the line is wrapped around the building like in and out. Yeah. And that is like, like if you take a step back and look at that situation, what are we doing as a community? What are we doing as a society where it's like you are sending hate, vile, disgusting things to someone you don't know, like you're weird. Yeah. You're weird for that. Like completely uh, the, agree, dude, Hassan, the amount of like vile, disgusting, hateful things that I was sent in those four months since that hit piece went live. Uh, I mean, you talk about each one of those individuals who there have been multiple people who, since reading my stuff on Nikki Swift.com who have come back and apologized profusely because they were like, we were lied to. And I was yeah. like, yeah, you were. Yeah. So, you know, for me, like to, if you're going to reach out to someone, at least know what you're talking about and, and take a step back and really digest everything first before you jump to conclusions. But that's the world we're in right now, man. It's so sad. It's so reactionary. And, and it's, it's listening to respond instead of listening to understand. There's no empathy. Everybody's so quick to judge. Everybody's so quick to throw in their two cents about stuff when it's like, just be quiet. If you yeah. don't have anything nice to say, just be quiet. Right. And and going back to that, what Brad's talking about is Tim and Soups have their falling out, and his immediate reaction is to call every studio, every sponsor, every person Brad ever introduced them to, send them an email saying that Brad was being investigated and among other allegations of him being a bad person. There was no evidence given, but the accusations were made. And studios responded the way that everybody else would respond to that. Okay, we're just going to back off on this and let them do their thing because – on my sponsors this. as well. Yeah. Like, I mean, all, all it, it wasn't them. just people who I introduced him to. It was people that we collectively worked with. Yeah. And if I'm being honest, like I handled 98% of those conversations. I'm the day-to-day -day manager, right? And let me be clear. I served as a manager for him when he needed one, but we never had a contract. So I can't technically be your manager. I was his best friend first. And then after that, it was like, if he needed someone to champion him, that's the role I took as his manager. Same with Taya Miller. So like, you know, no contracts. I can't technically be your manager. And if you're upset about anything at any given time, there's the door. Like, yeah. I'm not, I can't stop you. Like, leave. Absolutely. Um, so, and I think that would have been any normal creator's response, right? You have a falling out, yeah. regardless of who's right, who's wrong. If you're upset with somebody in a work environment like that, you leave. So had he just walked away in that moment you would have been in a much better position. Both of you guys would have been because he he didn't need to do what he did, but he decided to go this really weird, you know, super villainy, uh, evil. <laughs> like it's evil route. Evil. I, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know why he would have done it. And I, w I hope to eventually get more context as to why he did it. And hopefully he like apologizes for it and, and discusses the mental health problem that lead to something like that happening because he I mean, did But that. dude, it, 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 you know, in that call, like I said, I, it was not a fun call for me and it was not a fun call for him, I'm sure, because I, I laid into him. I mean, he was very arrogant and oozing ego and, you know, just entitlement and insecurity. And what's funny is the most insecure individuals generally have the biggest egos to overcompensate, right? So like, that's like fact. So for me, you know, looking at this behavior and these these trends that i started to see at the end of our relationship you know a lot of red flags for me and, and me being his friend and i'll tell you the same thing huss and i'll tell any of my friends the same thing it's like 
you know, you're, you're kind of going down a path that, that doesn't end well. And I had a conversation with him in August, uh, shortly after we got back from Hawaii and I sat him down and I said, you remind me a lot of Anakin Skywalker. And I, I know, you know, where this is going, but I, I, I sat him down and I said, you remind me a lot of Anakin. You're young, you have tremendous talent, you have a laser focused work ethic. Um, and I think you have a really bright future, but if you don't get control over your emotions, they will ruin you. And I feel like I've lived out the revenge of the Sith in the last six to seven months. Um, and I'm sure some of you were laughing, but it's not funny. It, it was a fucking nightmare. Damn. Now, uh, so after they had their falling out, Matt did what he did. So Spider-Man No Way Home, the red carpet premiere for that had happened. And Brad, who is a lifetime Spider-Man fan, lifelong MCU fan, but Spider-Man meant something very significant to him was not allowed to that premiere, even though he is the man who I've known for just being the guy at every premiere. For years of his life, he's he's had that honor and that privilege, and he's loved every uh, second since, of it. Since since 2015, man. Yeah. Like, I've been walking. I've had the, the opportunity and the pleasure, and, and I'm so grateful. It was truly my most favorite thing that I got to do. I wasn't paid. I wasn't compensated. And I didn't care. I worked at a movie theater growing up in high school. So for me to be able to experience these films or projects at that capacity uh, first – you know, that was a dream scenario. And I would literally go see any film, good or bad, at that capacity if if given the opportunity. So the fact that I've been able to do it since 2015, which my first one was Age of Ultron, um, wow. which, mind you, Soups was like 12 or 13 at that time. <laughs> so for, for – he's probably in middle school. So for him to, to come out and say that I used him to go to premieres uh, is, is rather hilarious um, considering I've been doing it since 2015. But – you know, at, at the same time, Hassan, if I'm like, yo, man, if, if do you want to go to the Dodger game next week? And you say, yeah. And we go have a ball at the Dodger game, you know, popcorn, hot dogs. We're just loving the game. We have a great time. And then a year and a half later, I come back at you and I'm like, Hassan, you use me to go to the Dodger game. That's not how that works. Right. Like I invited you. So like he invited me to a ton of events and I invited him to a ton of events. That's what friends do. Um, you don't see me pointing fingers and saying he used me for X, Y, Z trips to Hawaii, Call of Duty championships, 100 Thieves party. You know, like I can go on and on and on and on and on, not to mention the tremendous value I, you know, spent, you know, being on the phone with him for four hours trying to talk him off a cliff because, you know, some girl he liked wanted nothing to do with him. You know, I don't get paid for that, but that's me being there for you as a friend and someone who really cares about you. So, you know, it's it's just, it, it's really, I'm, I told you this personally, but like, I'm really embarrassed to have been a part of this situation. And I'm, frankly, I'm the one who lost everything. I lost all Damn. my sponsors, my credibility, my reputation was shattered. Um, and, and I was at death's door. I mean, like this took me to my, my limit. And I, I want the listeners to kind of take a minute to, to sit with this. But like, you know, you wake up one day, you look in the mirror and you're like, I know this person. I've been this person my whole life. I know who I am personally and professionally. I know, at least I think I know who my friends are. Uh, I know what my work is. I know what my goals are. I know what my immediate future may look like. Um, and then the next day you wake up and all of it's gone. And I, and I want you to sit with that because I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, and, and I take responsibility for my mistakes in, in that I clearly was doing some things as a manager uh, that I wasn't supposed to be doing uh, as far as negotiating and stuff. But that was just my way of providing extra value if they needed it. So, you know, I take responsibility for that. You know, I, I misunderstood the Talent Agency Act. And at least from me speaking to my attorneys and many, many people in the industry, you know, a lot of people are unlicensed and are working at that capacity because that law is very blurred now with the, the injection of a lot of, you know, the social space, you know, influencers, digital creators. It's not as black and white as it used to be. So, you know, this is a learning experience for me on what I can and can't do. Um, but at at its core, it was just me providing value and opportunities and just trying to help at whatever capacity I could. Right. And what Brad's talking about is after after that happened with Soups, he, he went after all of the sponsors. He went after all the studio contacts, everybody. He went after Brad's entire life. Brad was still trying to get back on his Literally. feet. He was dealing with the rumors and the allegations, but he was still working. He was still trying to figure everything out. And then February came and the rap dropped a hit piece on him. Yeah. Brad knew it was coming. Because the reporter had reached out to him, he had given him 
file, Google Drive folders full of evidence with screenshots, anything that you needed to prove his innocence on every allegation. He also gave him character witnesses, including me, as well as several other of Brad's friends, and, and not just friends, but people who have worked with him over the, uh, the years. For 15 plus years, yeah. 15 plus years. He didn't reach out to any of us. I can safely say Umberto did not reach out to me. I checked my emails, my spam box, both of my Instagram accounts, all of my emails. He never did. And that it went from a journalistic piece about a story where he could have found the truth in that. He could have found it. He could have wrote the article that said, TikToker comes to us to slander a Hollywood manager's name or to make it a discussion about cancel culture or a discussion about collaboration. But instead, he went at the hit piece route because he thought Brad was never going to be able to stand on his two feet again and write an article or, or be able to to fight this so and i, I want to touch on that because that's really important because you know i had close to 50k followers yeah. right and now i'm sub 40 i lost a ton and I, frankly i don't care about the follower count but it's just the point if i'm competing against at least three influencers that have millions of followers there is no shot that my voice is going to compete with that so you know yet another reason why i didn't bother responding at the time uh, beyond the fact that my life was decimated and left in ruins and I was emotionally just destroyed. Yeah. Um, but it, that I, was, I wasn't going to win that screaming match. Yeah. So, you know, after the, the long two days or three days that the, the discourse and the back and forth on social media lasted, uh, nobody spoke of it ever again. So, yeah. you know, if something's real... Uh, it has legs and it continues beyond 48 hours or 72 hours. So, you know, my whole thing is like, I think that speaks a lot for that. And then not to mention the evidence and context that I provided to Nikki Swift and multiple other interviews and podcasts and stuff that are coming out now. Um, you know, this isn't a, oh, you know, I, I've heard a lot of stuff on social. It's like, why did Brad take four months to respond? It's shady. You know, he must have been up to something. It's like, you know, Umberto had the evidence in, in January for at least the allegations and claims that he brought to my attention. Now, the article itself provided a bunch of other stuff that I wasn't privy to prior, which is in journalism. And, you know, you've got to bring stuff to me to, especially when it's a claim or an allegation, to, to fight it. Because if I don't know about it, I can't fight it. So, like, you know, that, that wasn't investigative journalism. That was a uh, selective storytelling, you know, and, and very fluffy creative storytelling at that but when you don't have lemons to make lemonade you got to get creative right Hassan? so you know for me <laughs> that's something that you know i i uh you know the evidence was there from day one in january so uh i i clearly have no control over how he decides to do his job or or not um but you know now the evidence is is there and it's being seen and like i said i have a ton of people coming crawling back refollowing me apologizing for believing it or being a part of it in regards to just you know slandering me and saying all these horrible things to me in my dms but like i said i i this isn't a tennis match going back and forth with those creators i i when they cut me off in november and and they did so without a conversation um i try to move on with my life and uh you know, I, I didn't reach out after a certain point. I just kind of cut them off and blocked them and moved on with my life, or at least I tried to. And then I was hit up by multiple businesses and, and sponsors and people that I work with hearing that these emails were being sent by Taya Miller and Matt Ramos, and they're really close friends. So, you know, yeah. let's look at the facts yeah. there. Um, and they were sending very cookie cutter, similar emails, uh, which prompted me to send, you know, a couple 20 year old kids uh, cease and desist from my attorneys in Los Angeles. So, you know, my whole thing is if you've been out in LA for a very short amount of time and you're getting cease and desist from one of the biggest law firms in Los Angeles, you're doing something wrong. So, yeah, <clears throat> off rip, I think it's worth having a discussion about. So, I've spent a decade in content creation, I've been doing it since I was 12. I'm 23. I skew up just a pinch older than them. Um, and I also had to like fight for everything that I have in a way that I don't think they did, which no disrespect to them and no disrespect to the hustle or the journey because everybody's is different. But being a cosplayer and being in such a well-accepted niche or, or being a guy talking about superhero things that has a manager that can take you to premieres is very different than being a solo content creator. Soup's off rip was getting the kind of brand deals that to this day I haven't gotten. And my digital footprint is... You know, he's got, I think, 2 million on TikTok. I have almost six. And he's got 200,000 on Instagram. 
I matched that beat for beat on YouTube. He's got a hundred thousand. I have one point seven million. So I mean, it's it's not even a competition, man. It's not, and I think it's worth the discussion of like. So he was he feels entitled to it because he got it immediately through your help of like getting brand deals and getting opportunities. The rest of us haven't been able to get that. It's harder to break into that without the help. So a lot of people are saying, why would you sign with the manager? Why would you want to lose 10% of your deals or 20% of your deals or 15% or whatever it is? It's because those deals don't exist if you don't have contacts. All of Los Angeles is built around nepotism and contacts if you don't know everybody you don't know anybody i've had to fly out to la every other month for the last several months despite just really wanting to stay home for a little bit because i have to show face i have to shake hands and meeting people and you know what that's that's paid off in spades but it, i have to keep doing it even now i've had a loss in the family and i honestly just want to stay in alabama in 10 days i'll probably have to go to vidcon not yeah. just for fun and i and i I'm not going to, for once I can say I'm, I'm not privileged place. Like, oh, I'm going to have to go to VidCon and I'll probably have fun and go. see friends, but I have to like, I have to go to, it's part of the career path. But creators like Matt Ramos got the boost that the rest of us weren't able to get. I've been having a, uh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I, I got to say, I, I want to send love and support your way. I know you <laughs> are dealing with that loss, man. That's, um, I dealt with a loss last year and it was crushing. So I, uh, want to take a minute to just throw that love your way because that's not something that you can just brush off and 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 keep it chill so you know that's that's not easy but you know in regards to the just manager stuff in a collaboration sense i think we would all love to have somebody in our corner myself included who is hitting the pavement knocking on doors sending emails reaching out following up chasing strategizing being creative executing producing editing etc 24 hours a day seven days a week um i think my career would be immensely better uh and bigger because of it uh if i had someone like that and and like you you you've said it ever since i've met you that you know to have someone like that in your life that just helps and it does which is why i feel like managers or agents are underappreciated because i feel like a lot of entitlement comes from the talent side where it's like i deserve your time and i deserve your effort and you know it it's to an extent that's true but at the same time it's like you know, there's a lot that we do, especially when you're building a foundation for someone. You know, if I start working with Charlie D'Amelio, I don't need to have to do a whole lot of foundational stuff because she's established and she's getting a lot of opportunities. But, you know, the people that I've worked with aren't established at that capacity. Obviously, there's a vast difference between Charlie D'Amelio and Matt Ramos, for example. So They look identical. What are you talking about? I've heard Charlie say Spider-Man No Way Home before. I've heard it a bunch. (laughs) Well, well, building that foundation, man, is important. You have to have a brand that is is looked at by these studios, that is looked at by these companies that are like, can we see ourselves working with this individual? And, you know, there's a lot of branding that goes into that. There's a lot of, you know, me typing up emails with – you know, uh, statistics and how to lay out your analytics and your insights to make the email very impactful and for hit to, you know, pack a punch, so to speak. And, you know, I've done that for you. I've done that for many, many people. But at the end of the day, it's like, I don't get paid to help you write an email, but I'm still taking the time to do it because that's just who I am, you know? Um, so it, it's, there's a lot of things behind the scenes that I think people don't, you know, take a, a second to understand or appreciate. And, you know, that that's that's been my problem where you know to have this he used me he leached me blah 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 that's a very me 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 arrogant egotistical you know entitled argument um but you know i i think it's important for us Hassan, especially for you who have been a huge collaborator throughout your entire career is to talk about what collaboration means and it's one side brings value to the table and the other side brings value to the table. And then everybody works collectively together to accomplish a goal or a project of some kind. Um, you know, and, and the definition of using is like, you know, let's say you're helping me get to events. You're giving me insight and advice. You're bringing money opportunities to me. You're helping me move. You're helping me with relationship advice. You're doing all these things. And then the second you reach out to me for help or assistance of any kind, I don't answer my phone, I don't text back, and I never respond in turn with that value. That is the definition of using. And I think a lot of people, once again, from a very entitled stance, uh, think 
quite highly of themselves and don't want to acknowledge like if I bring you an opportunity, Hassan, to shoot a promo piece for a blockbuster film, that is value on my part, bringing it to you. If you say no, I'm going to go find 15 other people in 25 minutes to do it. So, you know, that's my value. I have, I have the opportunity that I'm bringing to you. So like that, that's where I just see the major disconnect where it's like, how is that using if I'm bringing you an opportunity? And if you say yes, you decided to do that. I, I don't sign for people. I don't force people into projects. People make their own decisions. And if you decide to do something, you can't be upset about it three years later. And I think that's the thing that has been, you know, everybody who has been aware of this article and has, I think most people read it, read it as a hit piece. It was hard to not read it as such other than the people who read the headline and they, they went for soups because at the time he was riding a wave of popularity. And, and you know, the thing is that ship has gone up and down as it always does with content creation, but he's very much been a polarizing figure in those communities always because he he has opinions that people don't agree with and he often backpedals and changes his mind and goes with whatever the crowd wants him to do and and you know what to each their own right like i understand maintaining popularity and and, and i'm not gonna pretend i haven't made a video i don't like because i wanted to to care towards an audience that i know is bigger than my sample size right now but when you're, you're talking about the collaboration aspect and talking specifically about matt saying that you used him because i think that one matt saying you used him in things like to it says uh, Brad Lambert awkwardly in all of Matt Ramos's videos. I think is a quote from the Raps article and, and, and like being shoved into it. But to me, it read as just friends hanging out. Like that's really what it, it, that's how it read from the outside in. That's the narrative that he put out there. And the reason I was giving the whole historical backlog on on my career and, and how long it's taken me to get where I'm at and versus Matt, because at this point. I am getting bigger deals. I'm on. I'm on the horizon of working with yes, you are. An, an amazing uh, manager and friend. Also, a friend I don't have a contract with. It's just just a friend of mine. Same way that, uh, like, it, you know. Shocking. And there's there's never been a question about it. But I'm humbled by it. I, I I don't feel entitled to it. I feel honored every time it is brought up. I had a meeting with Disney PR thanks to Brad helping me craft probably one of the most amazing emails ever. And we had a wonderful conversation. I haven't heard back much since, but you guys know what my content looks like. So I understand if they did a little digging and they're like, mm, maybe this is not it, but maybe the pendulum will swing back that way because I, uh, all timing, man. <laughs> it's all timing. He's right about it's that. Uh, but you know, the opportunities that you are given really, really are built upon the the collaborative effort or the collaborative people in your life. Like the opportunities you have are based on them. Like Brad had a lot of pull because he's built wonderful relationships with people. That's what he is at his core is a man who builds relationships. And this story was always so interesting to me because I don't really understand where the antagonism came from. And 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 as an outsider, I'm Brad's friend. We just started working together. We have one deal in the works. He's helping me uh, just talk to – I think I'm allowed to say – I think we're, we're talking to G Fuel. We're potentially going to do a giveaway of a Spider-Man No Way Home refrigerator, which like I'm excited about because I, I like G Fuel. I love Spider-Man No Way Home. And the idea of doing a giveaway for my fans is a slam dunk. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> love G Fuel. Love them. But uh, we, were in, we were in talks doing that, and then this article came out, and that – opportunity immediately left the table for me i was no longer able to to follow up i even attempted to through my other uh the other channel i work for who has g fuel contact i was like hey could you hit them up and see if that could be on the table like i'll talk to them solo about it they never even got back to me they knew it they, they said yeah heard about that we will get back to you about it if we think it's the right fit or whatever and they never got back to me i lost out on that opportunity but I wasn't upset or angry by it. I wasn't entitled to it. It would have been awesome if I'd gotten it, but I wasn't. Yeah. And I think that these younger creators, because they're going to red carpets off rip, right? When you're when you're rubbing shoulders with Sir Patrick Stewart and Elizabeth Olsen at the Multiverse of Madness premiere, I bet it is hard to to sit down and look at yourself as to who you were versus who you think you are. Um, and and that's where I think mental health in the content creator space is really, really limited. Like mental health help LA has a lot of crack therapists. And I think it's a lot of say yes, men therapists who just want to take your yeah. money and, 
and they they come in there and they evangelize, uh, evangelize you. They just like basically make you feel better about yourself and your presence and who you are, and they feel your narcissism complex. And I don't know that these people are going to them, but I wouldn't be shocked if they were, based on a lot of the things that they've done since. It, it hasn't been coming from a very a place of like humble understanding. And and when me and Brad talked about doing this episode. I wanted it to be at its core about the collaboration, but I did want to take some time to tell that story start to finish because it's one that I still to this day don't fully understand. I would love for Matt Ramos to, to just like sit in front of you and discuss it with you. Like just look at you and have that discussion and, and, and just like talk about it so he could look you in the eyes and we could see whether his reality is warped or not. Because I think that, I think the kid might be sick if this is what he's doing, or maybe there's a huge piece of story that I have no idea about. I doubt that at this point, uh, you've been so honest and transparent. I don't mean that nobody likes having their life ripped to shreds Mm -hmm. and, and put out there for everyone to see at whatever capacity they want to do that. Um, you know, like I said, Matt was my little brother, but you know, when he cut me off the first week in November, there was no communication on his behalf. Uh, he totally ghosted me. He didn't respond to any of my outreach. Uh, I was completely left in the dark, which was like, you know, if you have a best friend and then they all of a sudden just disappear off the face of the earth, it's kind of like they died. And that's kind of what it felt like for me. You have to and grieve it. Was it. A, yeah. It was like a, a pet cemetery situation because it was like he died and then he came back to life and then he was trying to destroy my career. Um, you know, I didn't watch Pet Cemetery, but that sounds like it. I said just yeah. destroy my career. I just imagined like a cat trying to beat you kill in you. the uh, the yeah. office. No, <laughs> trying to kill yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean that that's that's kind of what Pet Cemetery is. But uh, hilarious movie and and classic at that. But you know, but the but the communication element. I mean, no relationship, professional, you know, dating, marriage, you know, friendships, whatever. No relationship works if the communication isn't good. Um, And I think that's a huge element. I think that's why you and I have a great personal and professional relationship because we, we don't withhold anything good or bad. You know, there's, there's immense transparency and professionalism. um, And, you know, the constructive criticism on both sides is there and it's met with, you know, I think there are two ways to respond to criticism. Uh, The first way is you take it and you, you kind of sit with it and then use it to, to evolve and get better, which we all can get better myself included and i'm always looking for ways to get better um and then the second way is you kind of hear what that person has to say and then you tell them to f off you know but but the but the third way which is kind of how this kind of transpired and and rolled out was you know he was very angry and he wanted to prove how powerful he was and uh he did what he did and uh that's just not normal behavior. And if there was a conversation that we could have had, I was willing to have it because I reached out multiple times, but that was not reciprocated on anybody's end on that other side. Um, So, you know, I I feel like whatever issues uh, that were never expressed uh, could have been expressed uh, in a conversation. And then, uh, you know, once again, there was no contract, so there was nothing I could do. I would have just had to have let them walk away. And I would have done that, you know, my whole thing, Hassan, and I've told you this before, but if you don't want me in your life, I'm not going to fight you for that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have too much self-respect and decency to to not beg to, to be in somebody's life. So, you know, I, I, I anybody listening out there, don't don't beg or fight to have somebody be in your life. If pe- somebody wants to walk away, then that's their loss. Let and them this walk isn't away. just professional advice, right? Like no, when you were I'm saying that, personal. I immediately thinking was like my high school ex-girlfriend, I feel like I was begging to stay present in that person's life. And they've been out of my life for a while now. And I don't think I've ever been happier. I don't think I've ever lived a better life. So just keep that in mind that, you know, you don't go fighting for stuff. I want to talk mental health with you specifically. Please, please. Mental health is really important to me. Uh, Same. For context, on bad days, you really hear about some of my worst days. And sometimes there's a comedic bit about my dad throwing a bookshelf at me. Other times it's just talking about the nuance of like that ex-girlfriend situation that really did, did a number on me. My terrible yeah. parents, whatever. I think you went through a really uniquely horrific scenario. You had your life disappear overnight. As a friend, I was terrified that in this trigger warning for everybody uh, about self-harm. I was so worried that you were going to kill yourself. I was terrified that that was what was going to happen because mentally, I don't know what you do next. You know, you had this wonderful booming career and all these friends. And then as people do, as people, especially in Los Angeles do, you lost the hype. You were no longer a person that could benefit them. So they left you. 
and you yeah. were left alone. And I think yeah. for me, that was one of the, that was one of the scariest things ever. I think everybody who lives in this house and my friends and people would, would, would say that I was constantly talking about being worried about you. And I called you really often to check in on you because. And bro, let, let me just say, you were one of the best friends uh, that I had during that time because I've known people for years who still have yet to this day said a word to me about anything. They haven't reached out. They haven't called, uh, you know, out of self-interest or protecting their own brand, whatever. Um, you know, uh, reaching out privately to someone is not going to hurt your brand. Um, so, you know, like that's where I just, I, I kind of hate this industry at that capacity where it's like, it is fake. You know, I, you know, there are people that I truly thought were like, some of my best friends, even family of sorts. And, you know, they, they quietly unfollowed me and, and they haven't said anything and they've ignored my exist, my existence. And, you know, it, it's just ironic when, you know, they similarly go through somewhat of a similar situation shortly thereafter. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's not fun. I mean, it, it's really not. And you're, you're talking about self-harm and I would be lying if I said I wasn't there. Um, I, I was at suicide's door and, and I want you you to be clear and the listeners to be clear, you know, these people put me there. They and, weren't and concerned with that. No. That's what, that's what I think is no. the most upsetting part of that. My generation, and they're a little bit younger than me, but they fall into this. We're far more aware of mental health. We are far more aware of it than any generation before us. We discuss it more often. It's so important. as a person who had participated, in not only your professional life, but your personal life, the way that Matt did, it really, really struck me as just inhuman what he did next. Uh, it felt like there was so much more to the story. And you read the articles and there never was. There wasn't anything else added. Um, the way that the community had responded. I had friends from the YouTube Shorts community, people that I talked to regularly, posting an article. They don't know you. They've never met you. But they were doing it in solidarity for them because they had gone out of their way to tell people of how much they were in turmoil and affected by this but i never really understood the breadth of the effect like i don't i never knew what you could have done that was so bad a lot of it and and this is this is my personal opinion but when i read a lot of the comments on some of their pages it sounded like you had physically assaulted them whether sexually or otherwise based on these comments of you're so strong i'm here for you i'm so brave you're so brave for telling your story that was a lot of the comments on their posts and i read that article back after i saw those comments and then i read it again and then i read the follow-up piece and at no point was an accusation or an allegation like that made. So what are they talking about? You were so brave for not liking your management and leaving it. Therefore you ruin his life. And, and that's what hurts so much to watch because they're people, they're people like I have friends who love Taya Miller and Matt Ramos. And these are friends that I love and sure. I, I trust their opinions highly. So I imagine that like personally, they're wonderfully kind people to be around whatever, like friends to see them do something like that really has me questioning just like their, holistic mental state they're they're I, I don't even know how to how to be around people like that and maybe yeah. there was one person who was running the ship and the other person just tagged along but regardless you stood complicit in what is one of the most horrific things i don't think you've i don't know how much you've talked about this publicly but i think it's one of the most important parts of this whole story um you losing a friend you lost a friend in this working environment Emperor. you lost a more important friend back in August of last year. And I didn't know about this until very recently. You May. didn't, you didn't may. Yeah. You yeah. didn't bring this up with me um, because you didn't want it to be part of this narrative. But I think it speaks to the greater narrative of who you are as a person and, and how important people are to you. Jimmy rich. Yeah. He was your best friend. He was Robert Downey jr's personal assistant, right? Or, right hand man, best friend, best man, everything. Right? Yeah. 20 plus years. Yeah. And, and Jimmy, I think that was the part of the story that I cried over. I got off the phone yeah. with you once and I sobbed about it because yeah. Jimmy Jimmy died unexpectedly. Jimmy died in a car accident. Yes, he did. And Brad, Jimmy brought Brad to LA. Jimmy was the guy who said, Brad, come here. I'm putting you on Team Downey as a springboard to kickstart your career because Correct. say you work for Robert Downey Jr. and then go get a job somewhere else because they're going to hire you. Instantaneously, yep. Of course, because – and that's what he did. It was his legacy – to give you this career, to help you start it because he loved you. He loved you so much and that's that's all he wanted. Look, Hassan, he he had one of the biggest hearts that I've ever seen a human have. Uh, he he would go out of his way to to bring opportunities, bring value. He never asked for anything or return. Um, 
you know, and, and he was just always there to help. And, and I think that was the most amazing thing about him. You know, he was rough on the outside, but he had the, the, the teddy bear mentality on the inside. And he was just such a good man. And, and the world is far less kind and, and beautiful and funny. My God, he was hilarious. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I still am not whole because of that. He, he was the biggest loss of my life uh, so far. I've been very lucky to not go through a, a ton of tremendous loss, but, but he was one of my best friends. I've known him for seven, eight years up to this point. He, he got me that opportunity. He championed me. He saw something within me as a person, as a professional, and, and he opened doors for me. And uh, he, he had me move out there with him. I lived with Jimmy when I first moved to LA. He didn't have to do that either. Um, so he, he, he is very much why I'm here, like where I'm at in my career. And, you know, I, I always tell people I don't have an ego because when you work with high level individuals and high caliber individuals, celebrities, athletes, influencers, you know, high level actors, et cetera, since you were like 16, 17 years old, <laughs> you know, you know where the finish line is, right. you know? How and, could you and, ever have an ego when Robert yeah, Downey like, Jr. is next to you ever? Yeah, I mean, and, and that, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, Lewis Howes, like, you know, Tom Billy, Jay Shetty, you know, uh, it, there are so many people, professional athletes who are just killing the game. Um, you know, it's, it's, you really sit back and you're like, yeah, I'm nowhere close to that. So I should probably shut my mouth. <laughs> but, you know, the, the Jimmy element of all of this is, you know, he, he died in May and I, I still haven't recovered i don't know if i ever will um the, he was such a massive impact on my life and and you know you never want to see a good person like that go and uh you know he he just he he got me to where i am today and i i've said that every opportunity that i can uh because of all the value and things that he did for me you know we'd be at lunch and i'd be talking about a opportunity that i wanted or a job that i was looking to get you know post team downey um, which was a short-term gig to be used as a springboard, as you said. Um, but he would like pick up the phone at the table while we were eating and call somebody at Marvel or somebody at Disney and just like, oh, you have an interview this day. And it was just incredible. Wow. I mean, it wow. was like, I didn't ask him. He just, he knew what made me happy, Marvel, obviously. So he would get me tickets to all these premieres. And, you know, he was one of the most giving individuals that I've ever uh, met and I, I feel like that's what we really connected on beside our love and passion for Pittsburgh sports um, but the the giving nature of us and, and who we are as people and you know the irony and the shit that pisses me off the most man is Matt always used to say that I was his Jimmy and and that makes me want to scream today yeah. uh, because I never would have done uh, what he did to me to Jimmy and uh that's the difference between us as people but you know it's 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 insane to me and and you know the fact that that was an ongoing narrative between our brotherhood the older brother mentor that like jimmy was for me um you know family etc you know and uh like i said you know he he died and and that was beyond devastating and and you know he always used to say get to work lambert and that was our our thing he would always text it to me or say it to me on the phone or in person and it was always said in a in an annoying uh tone because you know we'd be eating and he'd be like get to work lambert and i'm like dude <laughs> we're eating you know so he would always <laughs> screw around and play games like that but he was just such a good man he always pushed you to be better than yourself and he would tell you to get off your ass and give you the constructive criticism. And even when you're feeling good about yourself, he would just let you know, like, stay, stay there, man. Uh, and, and I always, you know, loved it. I have voicemails from him that are just absolutely hilarious. You know, he always loved and admired my positivity, but he would always poke and pick on me about it so you know i have voicemails of him being like mr positivity mr positivity what's up mr positivity <laughs> and it, it's you know and those always made me laugh because you know i knew his his criticism or his his playfulness never came from a a a, a, a space of hurt or harm um but yeah, I mean, that was, that was devastating. And, and what really frustrated me about this entire situation is for them to bring, you know, my time at Team Downey into this, which had no relevance of anything because 
uh, Matt, Taya, any of these individuals weren't a part of my time at Team Downey. I didn't even know they existed at that time. So, you know, for them to dig that far back to try to find something bad about me, which, which was very desperate on their end, digging like a terrier to find something, um, but dragging them in, dragging Downey in, dragging, you know, essentially what all that Jimmy did to impact my life in a positive way and then collectively taking a dump on everything, um, that infuriates me to no level. So I, I, uh, you know, I'm disgusted. I'm, I'm embarrassed. Uh, and, and frankly, like I said, I just wanted to move on with my life. But when it came down to, you know, proving how powerful he is, when I when I basically told him I, I on that conversation, man, I told you it wasn't a fun conversation for either of us, I'm sure. But I, I looked at him and I said, you know, take away your social media followers. What are you? And when I say you could hear a pin drop on the other side of the phone and that harsh reality gets set in, um, that was a grounding moment to say, look, man, like we're 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 still building here. We're trying to build a foundation. I'm trying to help you build a foundation of success for both now and in the future. You can't get too high, man, because TikTok could get deleted tomorrow. Like that's been a conversation, an active conversation. So if it gets deleted, who and what are you? And, you know, we've talked about this. You take away your social media following. You have a tremendous business marketing comedic background, right? You take away my background or my social media, and I have 15 years of business and marketing experience in the sports and entertainment industry. So, you know, I'm good. I don't need social media, but I think that's a greater conversation that I'd like to have with you beyond the mental health aspect of all this, which is, you know, if your social media is who you are, you're in trouble and you need to take a step back and pivot right now because social media won't last forever. No, you know, it will look not. back at look at look at MySpace, look at Vine, look at Periscope, look at Clubhouse. Periscope. You, know, <laughs> you you have to you back. have to pivot and you have to adapt. Social media is a tool, okay? Uh, it, it is a tool for us to use to build our brands, to send out messages, to to make an impact. Um, but if 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 your social media is who you are that's a dangerous game because if it disappears tomorrow, so do you. So that that's something that you have to build behind the scenes. You know, the relationships that you acquire, the the resume that you build, uh, which which comes from putting time, effort, and energy in, doing paid work, doing free work, whatever you can to get that experience, get those notches on your belt to build relationships. Like you said, this industry is built on relationships. And frankly, I lost almost all of mine uh, because of the the half truths and twisted facts and BS that they said. Um, so I'm very much hoping I can kind of rekindle a lot of those relationships and the respect that I had with those people. Because to be frank, you know, this wasn't real. Yeah. So you know, for me, I hope a lot of people can see the Nikki Swift stuff and and the other stuff that's coming out. But the I love the quote: "Leave people better than you found them." And I think that's very important. And all of those individuals that were involved in that article uh, are not worse off since knowing or associating with me in any capacity. And I think that's pretty evident, um, you know, and I, I think that says it all, honestly. Um, you know, I was the one that is, you know, technically owed money for projects that I worked on uh, by certain people. Um, and I wasn't compensated. And then I was the one who lost everything due to the crusade that was initiated so you know the mental health element of all this you know it's called bad days podcast i experienced the worst days i've ever had in my life i'm 33 years old i i never thought in my entire life that i would be in a situation like this because contrary to a uh, public narrative i don't go out of my way to hurt harm or injure anybody uh, i think my brand and my content and who i am and and what my reputation has been in the last 15 plus years reflects that um, contrary to people who have known me for years, who are now speaking out now that it's something, you know, divisive to talk about, you know, for, for clout or branding for their own personal gain. Uh, that's not how it works. You know what I mean? You can't wait three years to say something, especially when it's like, who used me, da, 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 da. It, it's just, it, it's a very juvenile, immature narrative, a very entitled narrative, when in reality, it's like, I didn't force you to do anything. I brought you an opportunity. And if you agreed to do it, that's on you. So, I mean, I, I don't know what more to say, but the, the fact of the matter is we all have a voice and we all should be using our voice to elevate and inspire and help other people instead of tearing people down. Um, and I think that's a really important narrative and, and, and stance that we need to take because social media right now, there's more negative than good. 
um, there's more hate than love. Uh, there, there's more critiquing and shit talking than support. And I, I think it's just a sad space because, you know, you look at this industry or this space and the best things come from collaboration. Uh, and the worst things of the space come from entitlement, arrogance, narcissism, et cetera. So it's like, okay, the best things come from us working together. One of my favorite quotes from the African proverb, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Nobody gets anywhere by themselves. So if you have the opportunity to collaborate with people, you share the same interests, you share the same passions, you each bring unique value to the table and you're able to accomplish great things. That's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I, I'm not a person that will take an opportunity from someone and move on. I want everybody to win. And I've always been that way. You know, and that's that's been the most frustrating element where it's like if I have any opportunity to help you and, and deal with something like for you, for example, I, I saw I didn't even know you really at the time. And I saw your TikTok was blocked or deleted. And I reached out and was like, I'll I'll try to help you, man. I can't make promises, but I want to try. And yeah. and I did. And it came back. And, you know, I didn't ask for anything and I'm still not asking for anything, but that's just like, you're a giving person. I'm a giving person. That's why we vibe and, and connect, but not everybody's like that. And I think the, at its core of this discussion is, you know, entitlement. And I also feel like when you weaponize your own acts of kindness, which is clearly what Matt did uh, on multiple occasions in that article, you know, who weaponizes kindness? Well, you and, know, and I, we're going to go back to, to Matt. Cause, cause the reason I, I brought up Jimmy, uh, and, and all that is to say that like Matt is, is 1923. He's young, but he's not that young, right? Young enough to understand the capacity of like, you had just lost your friend. I know he knows this because you took him to Robert's office to pick up Jimmy's things to take back to his family. You introduced Matt to Robert Downey Jr. And you did that on purpose. You did on that purpose. to inspire him. You did that to elevate him, to use probably one of the greatest connections anybody on earth has. And you brought this kid on to have that because you know, that's the kind of thing Jimmy would have done. That's the kind of thing Correct. you knew Jimmy <laughs> would have done. So that's why you Correct. did that. Yeah. And Matt knew that too. Matt spent enough time with you to know that that is why you did that. That is who you are. Right. He spent time with your family right. and then he went and did what he did. And I think that's, that's the far more harping. Like forget the, he, he did this to me. He did that to me. He did this. Matt, put you on the brink of suicide after knowing that you had just lost somebody after going to Hawaii with your family, after spending hours and hours on the phone with you. That's the thing that I can't understand. I can, I can understand people being crazy in LA and wanting to attack other people and ruin careers because they're bored. I get that because sadly it's, it's a, it's an important thing in LA to be virtually a supervillain, but to do what he did, knowing what he knows about you being such a part of your life. I think that's, that's, there's just no empathy there. There's bro. nothing. Like, there's like, nothing. There. Like that's only thinking of yourself. And, you know, I told you the controlling the emotions thing was a huge element of, of him. And I think we've all seen the rage videos of him smashing his desk and breaking controllers playing Fortnite. I mean, that was one of his top performing content prior to me coming into the fold. And that content stopped after I came into the fold because that's not brand friendly and no brand or studio wants to associate with someone who's throwing a tantrum. Um, so for me, that was something that I really tried to help, you know, guide him in a sense of putting out brand friendly content and getting him situated as such. And I have texts of him saying, thank you for keeping me in check and helping me and blah, blah, blah. You know, the, 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 the love and admiration that I think we had for each other as friends was evident. And, you know, there was never a discourse back and forth that exists. Uh, over any platform that was negative of any kind. Uh, there was never a fight of any kind, um, you know, uh, uh, talking shit, nothing. Um, I'm sure there was a ton behind the scenes. I think that's very clear based on how this whole thing panned out. But, um, you know, it wasn't my doing. Um, so for me too, you know, we, we talk about taking the high road and understanding that our actions and words have an impact on others. You know, when when they all decided to cut me off in November, I sent Matt a business opportunity shortly thereafter. Um, I didn't ask for anything. It was a paid gig uh, with an agency to promote a big upcoming digital streaming show. And he did the deal. But that came from me. I sent the email to the agency. I gave them his contact information because I thought it'd be great for the opportunity. And my conscience is clear at night because I know who I am contrary on the uh very pertinent effort and trying to paint me the opposite. 
uh straw hat goofy same thing you know he he got involved in this i'm not quite sure why and i was really disappointed because i considered him someone that i really admired and respected and considered him a friend um and but he he jumped on the train for whatever reason and, and said what he said but i also sent him the same deal so you know he ignored all my initial outreach on text and i have screenshots of this and uh i ended up having to just connect him and the agency directly over email so he could do this deal um and i didn't have to do that either but i did because i knew he'd be a great fit and i knew it was a paid gig so like you know once again it's like i i brought paid gigs to these individuals well after they did me dirty and you know boss logic same thing over the years studios and brands have reached out to me and i had every opportunity to put the hammer down and say what I want to say, but I've always given his information out to them and wish them the best of luck on their endeavors. Um, but I, I'm just not that person, you know, it's just, I, I'm not here to bring people down. Like if you, if you go down, that's your own doing. It's not mine. I think <clears throat> where a lot of that stands, it's something that I want to say directly to the creators. I don't know if you guys watch this or whatever. You're not, You've done some really, really disgusting things as far as I'm concerned. You're not beyond redemption, and there's no time like right now to stop what you're doing, apologize, own it, take the hit, you're young, you'll bounce back, and you'll feel a lot better for the rest of your life knowing you're not doing what you're doing. Because I promise you, like I've been young. I've been spiteful. I've been angry. I did it in a far less public way, obviously, but I've done things that I regret. And we the, all have, man. Everyone that's, that's does. Life. That's life. That's, that's part of growing up. Right. And it's a thing of like, you're never too far. You're never too far gone. Right. You want to sit here and watch every superhero movie? Well, we like watching Loki on screen and Loki killed like hundreds of people, like murdered them. If you guys remember that shit, he murdered people in the first Avengers movie. So like, we love him on screen. If Loki can get a redemption, you're not anywhere near as charismatic as Tom Hiddleston. No one really is, but you could. You could if you step up. And that's the thing. These, these, are, these aren't conversations to drag someone's character. They're to hold up a mirror to them because I think that the people in their life haven't. I wish that I could have had a conversation with Matt over the last several months through our mutual friends and stuff. I know one of them did reach out to him and say, hey, like right when the article dropped, Hussin, uh, this is my friend Hussin. He works with Brad. He'd like to talk to you one-on-one -on -one and hear your side of things because – I trust Brad and I love Brad and, and we've been good friends. At the same time, I know that there's a big overarching narrative and, and I'm a pretty good judge of character. So I know like during a conversation, I could hear the gaps and, and what someone's saying. He never took that call. He never did. I think Taya was reached out similarly by mutual friends and she never did either. So well, this look, is the, their it, moment here's of the life. Thing. Well, look, once again, I wish them all the best. Yeah. I will continue to send stuff their way. That's just who I am. But I just want my life back. You know, I think it's pretty clear. You know, a lot of people like to use the word slander and they don't know what it means. Uh, slander is not shit talking. <laughs> slander is when you say something that is knowingly false to hurt, harm, or injure somebody's life or reputation. And I think it's pretty clear based on the, the hit piece that named me directly, made all these accusations and claims that had no evidence or context that provided to back them. Uh, and then me coming out with the actual evidence that was in their hands back in January um, that proves all that stuff was lies. Yeah. Um, that, that is slander. And that's why me and my team are having those, you know, litigation conversations for a defamation and slander lawsuit because I lost everything. Uh, I, the damage is professionally, the damage is personally, the damage is mentally, physically. I mean, they're up there. Uh, and, and I, I've even had attorneys DM me in the last few days, like, hi, you don't know me, but I've seen this whole mess. Uh, are you looking into a lawsuit? Because you should. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where it's like, you know, I, I don't want to get to that point, but at the same time, it's like actions have consequences, but there's a difference between, you know, me saying something that's factual and based in truth and it makes you look bad. That's not slander. Just because it makes you look bad, you need to kind of take a step back and look in the mirror. Right. Right. So like, you know, I, I've taken accountability for what I apparently did wrong with the talent agency act, but that error didn't hurt, harm or injure. Any I'm gonna, of these I, people. I'd like to touch on that real quick as a creator in the space, the talent agency act, no one abides by it outside of your large mega agencies and the mega agencies Thank you. are all criminal. Like every single from 
no disrespect. I don't I don't I don't want to name agencies because I don't really want more people bothering me anymore, especially people with TikTok contacts because I don't have those. Yeah, but I wouldn't. There's so many of these huge, larger than life agencies. They definitely abide by the Talent Act. I don't know any of them that have given a single deal to a creator under 30 million followers that is brandable and in news articles already. They focus on their top brass and they acquire other creators to bolster numbers. They don't help with anything. Individual managers and boutique agencies are the only ones that have actually helped any creators at all in the space. And that is a known fact amongst content creators. So this whole like narrative that they're spinning of Brad did something so criminal, the town MC act. I can promise you none of us care as creators. Companies don't take us seriously. I have, you know, 5 million followers, but if I ask a company, Hey, I want $5,000 for a post. That's a steal for them. That is a deal and a half for them, but they will look at me and they'll say, how about 500? But if a manager is in the space in the conversation, he asked for 20, they'll counter with 18. That's the difference, right? Correct. And and not and on top of that, social media and content creation as this type of money making machine is young. It's not old Hollywood. Agency, like the Talent Agency Act, is something that was very like sloppily put together to to add to you know existing agency. It's just outdated now. It's, it's just completely outdated. outdated. It doesn't the, make a the, lot the of sense. Is, the space has changed, man. And I think yeah. you know I, I think that's a major thing where. You know, uh, how, what kind of person makes money off someone and they're not even licensed? That's insinuating that I didn't do any work, yeah. which is clearly not the case. So it's like, what kind of person is trying to make an argument and totally shit on any time, effort, and energy that was done to make another person look bad? Like, it, it yeah. is just so desperate. But, you know, I, I think the main thing, I had a conversation with a friend yesterday, and she just got hit up by an agency, and it, it's not a huge one. But I just said, look, like, be a big fish in a small pond instead of being a minnow in an ocean. And I think that is, like... A lot of people want to sign with the CAAs and the UTAs and, and the massive agencies. I mean, who wouldn't? But at the same time, it's like to be with a boutique agency or a, or a one-man team like myself, you know, you're getting the most hands-on experience of time, effort, energy, personally, professionally. If you call a manager who works at CAA and you want to talk about how a girl doesn't like you and you're so upset and depressed about it, he's going to be like, I don't have time for this. Uh, call me when you're done, you know, and just hang up the phone. My current brand manager is one of my best friends. I call him about when I say bullshit, I mean bullshit. And we sit on the phone for an hour and a half, two hours, and we laugh and we talk about life. And he honestly, he doesn't need this. He's only doing it because he likes me. He has no he works in, in a different pool of entertainment. He's just doing it for fun. That's how managers work. So yeah. I saw Boss Logic in in a comment thread yesterday because someone decided to paste your article into there fighting you. He did some pretty terrible things with the town agency. Boss, you know this. I know this, man. No one does that. And, dude, you're still a crazy talented artist. Just apologize and move on. Like, he, well, It was three years ago. He, it was. He thanked, he thanked me publicly three years ago on his Instagram post. Thank you for everything you did for me. Best of luck in the future. And now three years later, everything that I did for him is apparently the worst thing ever. Oh, it's And crazy. that's where it's like the timeline just doesn't make sense. But that's the problem when you lie is you have to come up with so many other lies to, to back your initial lie. And frankly, it's just not working out for them, which is why I'm telling them just like, just go away, move on with your life. You guys have wrecked my life. Uh, undeservingly so and you know especially after all that i did and to be frank boss like really didn't pay me until like month 12 that's when the first amount of money came in and a lot of money came through his bank account and he just chose like he didn't respect me man and that was evident based on him dragging me along i'll get you on the next one i'll get you on the next one blah -de blah -de blah and it wasn't until i finally had enough at month six seven where i was like dude, like, this is ridiculous. I'm devoting so much time, effort, and energy into this. And if you're calculating the money that I make, Hassan, I'm making less than minimum wage. But once again, as a manager, I'm not managing Ariana Grande, okay? So I don't right. make a lot of money. If I make a couple extra grand a year, amazing. But I do management because I love working with people who are friends. I love working with people who I admire and who inspire me. I, and I love helping people. That's why I love being a manager. It's not because I get rich, because I freaking don't. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's just it's just so unnecessary. And it's like, 
why can't we just elevate each other? You know, it's but also I think one it, of those things to where like I don't I don't really understand this narrative of like this is my deal and I want all of it, twenty percent, fifteen percent, whatever the percentage may be. It's just like unless it's something egregious like thirty five, forty, fifty, dude, it's nothing. You still made a boatload of money. It's the same kind of people who, when it gets to tax season, where they're just like miserable about it and they're angry that the government's taking all their money. I'm like, dude, you shouldn't have ever looked at it as your money. I don't look at a penny in my bank account as mine until after all my fees are paid, after my rent is yeah. paid, because that's how you keep a healthy mindset. And these kids are like coming at you like, oh, man, I don't want to pay 20 I, I can't believe Boston just pay you like as you were going along with it. Well, I, and, I can't imagine dude, doing that, dude. And, and what the irony of the entire situation is when I was courting him to work together and pitching like, let's try this, let's figure it out. You know, he was like, I don't trust you. I'm afraid you're going to screw me over financially. Like, you're going to steal my money. And I was like, fine. Like, you know, the money will be sent directly to you, and then you'll pay me when the money comes in. And he was like, cool, done. And that's what we did. Every project, every contract he signed, the money was wired to him, and I never, you know, got it. So yeah. the last project, we ended up agreeing on on the money being sent to me directly, which is backed in emails, and I have those emails. But like, that's how I got paid. I had to literally give my information to the studio instead of it coming from who I thought was my friend and someone that I worked with. But, you know, at the end of the day, like whatever claim boss thinks he has because of the Talent Agency Act, I spoke with my attorneys and they're like, you know, he missed the statute of limitations because that was like friggin' three years ago. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, just move on, dude. Like, you know, now you know, and now I know. And I had a reporter I spoke to yesterday who was like, what was the first time you heard about this, this talent agency act? Has anyone ever asked you about it? I was like, when this thing happened, like yeah, when, it when, doesn't... when Umberto reached out, that was the first time anybody in my life has ever asked me about it. Yeah, it's insane because none of us have ever heard of it. And, you know, I'd like to speak to the rap's presence on TikTok. You guys didn't exist on that platform. And then you made an account and you followed Matt Ramos soups and you posted videos with soups. And I think it's one of up until probably two weeks ago, your only videos that performed above 500, 600 views. It seems, it seems very clear. The rap took this article so they could use soups and Taya and straw hat and whoever else to bolster their social media presence and to, to enter in the realm of TikTok because they're an outdated place who isn't existing in current media, which is short form content. They weren't doing that. And now they, now they are. So it's I mean, a lot look, of very clear things. If you sit here and take 10 minutes to look at the situation, just not from an idiot's perspective. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, this is so crystal clear. Everything. Dude, I, I had, I had my first Twitch stream last night in a while, obviously. And uh, obviously, obviously, I was flooded with hate and, and shit talking and people really being rude to me in the comments. And, uh, you know, I, I had the articles from NikkiSwift.com drop in there. And then the same people who were talking shit after about 15, 20 minutes of reading the articles were like, oh, wow. OK, uh, sorry. <laughs> and, and that's my thing where I'm like, yeah, uh, that's, you know, they they put out a story let's say it was a thousand piece puzzle, right? A complete puzzle, thousand pieces. But they put out a 300 piece out of a thousand piece puzzle and said, this is the full story. Look at all this stuff. And now with my, my stuff that's coming out now, I filled in the rest of the puzzle. You were missing about 700 pieces. And yeah. now that I've given it to you, you know, it's like, well, wow, this isn't, this isn't what I thought it was at all. But, you know, my relationship with Matt, my relationship with Taya, my relationship with these other people, Charmian Lee and Straw Hat Goofy, everybody was like on the up and up. Like everybody was good. This wasn't a declining situation in the least. Uh, you know, Taya Miller in the article, it says that we haven't spoken since June when I yelled at her about a premiere. I have a multiple texts since then. I have multiple conversations with her. We hung out multiple times. We have photos with each other since then. And then the first week of November, I actually have an audio text from her where it's like, I miss you. Let's get lunch next week. Let's just talk, blah, 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 blah. And I have this audio text, Hassan. Like, yeah. I have it. And I just sit back and I'm just like, that right there contradicts the lie that was told in the rap it, it, immediately, you yeah. know? So it, and it wasn't like a few days later, she cut me off with Matt and everybody else. So it was just a very obvious, like, my deductive reasoning of, of sitting back watching this whole thing play out. It's like, yeah, well, I see the dots connecting, and I see how this happened and how this person got involved and all this stuff. It was just, 
just like yeah, you know, cyberbullying at its finest, mm -hmm. and and people who are very insecure, uh, doing what they can to make themselves feel better. Yeah, I think the big takeaways from this whole situation, and and the things to to look forward to is that is that one. Hopefully, if you're a studio or a company, and and you walked away from this, or if you're new and you haven't even met Brad, reach out. I think it's time that we we don't let bullies when we don't let people who are spinning false narratives win. And then if you're the people who spun the false narrative, you're not beyond redemption, right? You've done something really crappy, but work towards being better. I think that's the biggest issue is a lot of people want to live in their misery. They want to live in the terrible thing they did and just call it their sin. Just be better. I think it, it's, it's pretty simple. Just don't do shit like this again. Apologize to people they're doing because you'd be shocked at how forgiving people are, even if you've destroyed their entire existence and their lives, which you guys, you guys did. And, and just look in the mirror and, and honestly go seek mental health. I think it's important that all of you guys who are involved in this, that did this, knowing what the truth actually was the whole time. I, I would highly recommend seeing a therapist to help navigate. I, I, that. I couldn't live with myself. I, I could not I literally could. live with myself. If, if I went out of my way to do something like this, when it's based not in reality. Like, it's vindictive. Like it's harmful. Me, and dude, it's also, it's, it's again, it's, it's like, I think Matt more so than anybody else involved in this article, he knew of your friend's passing. He vacationed with your family. He hung out with you every day. I, I, I couldn't imagine a more just disgusting betrayal than that. So Matt, if you listen to this man, just, uh, think, sit down and really think about this stuff. And, Put the soups hat away and be Matt Ramos and look in the mirror and just have a conversation with yourself, man, because I think you need one. And this isn't no hate. No disrespect. We have a couple of mutual best friends. So I'm not trying to do that, but I do think it's important. I'm older than you. I've been in the field longer than you. You're super talented. So is everybody else he involved. Is. And that's the crazy thing. Boss Logic, it, Brad is calling me and telling me everything is happening, right? And I'm sitting here saying, there's an extra monitor over there. And in the corner of that monitor is a wallpaper that says BSL because I literally had Boss Logic wallpapers on my screens and I didn't even notice. Stupidiously talented guy, Matt. Well, he's, he he, he is truly Boss is one of the most creative, talented people. He's a creative genius. Like he I've is. Said this, I've said this since day one, and that's what drew me to the opportunity because I saw that he could do so much more, and I wanted to help him in any way that I could for him to achieve whatever he wanted to achieve. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even to this day, he's, he's insanely talented. Like, yeah, we and I can... wish, I wish him the best. Like I, I still, it's crazy after all of this, I still care for these people. Cause when you work with people for so long and, and have personal relationships, which I did with these people, like still care for them even yeah. after they did all this. And, and I just, like I said, this isn't a tennis match. This isn't a screaming match. This isn't a, oh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Frankly, I don't care because whatever you do say at this point has been clouded with your credibility going to shit because you didn't tell the full truth before. So I don't care. Just move on. I want to move on. I want my life back. I want my sponsors back. I want what I lost back. And I just want to get back to living my life. That's it. That's it. You guys started this. This is me responding. And then we're done. We're moving forward. Yeah. That's it. And I hope that that was clear throughout this conversation that this isn't a, a shit flinging match. This is this was no, it's not our opportunity to tell Brad's story in a way that like I'm it personally connected because I was there for a lot of it. I was I was with him through through most of the terrible things that he had to go through. So it's not coming with perspective of hey, I'm trying to write a hit piece and I don't need clicks. I think I think all of us know this and I think Matt should yeah. be able to see this that this isn't like going to the rap that's a illegitimate news source who needs whatever clicks they can get. I, bad days is my fun project and, yeah. and I'm on plenty of other things that get plenty it of has other a views. purpose though. It does. Like I love this podcast <laughs> because we're, we're talking about subjects like mental health and, and collaboration and, and what using actually means. And, yeah. you know, like when, when you invite someone to be a part of some something and they say, yes, you can't be mad that they were a part of something because you invited them into it. So it's like, you know, for example, with Matt and I, he invited me into those interviews. He invited me into the content. I have texts of him saying, be at my house in 25 minutes to film something. So it's like, you know, I, mm -hmm. I wasn't breaking into his apartment and forcing myself into his content. Like yeah. he literally would willingly come over my place to right. use my studio to film the press junket interviews with Disney, which he invited me into because I wasn't previously involved with that. Uh, but once again, you, you, you have a 30 year old guy who's, who's been working for a long time, who's has a, had a good reputation, um, you know, sitting next to you in those interviews, it definitely helps you. 
So, and especially we if you're inexperienced, which yeah. there's no, that's no slander. That's nothing thrown his way. Being experienced and being on camera is it's difficult. Like I, it took me years to be comfortable on screen, just talking like this. If you go back on my YouTube channel, you can find what it looked like before I was comfortable sure. on screen, and it's terrible, terrifying. Me and uh, the most recent episode of Absolute Comics over on the Absolutely Marvel and DC channel, Benny talked about why Comic Story had hired me, and in it, he took a second to talk about how I didn't even realize that I was going through a trial period. Which to touch on collaboration towards the very tail end of this, but I made videos with Comic Story for four months before I was hired by Comic Storian. And I'm not calling Benny and be like, hey, where's my back pay for this? I was a collaborator. I was a creator who was a guest star who was having the greatest time ever. And now I get to be an employee who's having a great and time. you chose to do that. Oh, absolutely. And I was happy <laughs> to do it, you know. But we talked about uh, on-screen presence. And they talked about how a lot of people think they can come on here and review this or interview Andrew Garfield or do whatever. Not a lot of people can, and I'm lucky enough to have had a decade of experience to where, like, I did an episode, it's it's the Absolutely Marvel and DC channel, it's very collaborative, it's very, like, discussion-based, and I did the Stranger Things review beforehand solo. I talked for eight minutes straight without missing a beat or missing a breath, and they brought that up that, like, Hussin knows how to do this, that's why he's allowed to be here. So it's not to say no one's ever going to be joining the cast of Absolutely Marvel and DC, but I was the first one for a reason. And uh, Matt probably you know, needed some, some help and guidance to get him there. And, and you were, you were that person. That's, that's how I'm looking at it from the outsider perspective. Um, it takes a lot to be really good on camera and to be really good at not only telling your story, but elevating someone else. It's a skill set like any other skill set. So yeah. you no, know, on our first phone call, I told you that you were one of the most well-spoken, intelligent people that I've ever come in contact with, especially no offense for, for your age. I mean, you, you are way more mature, way more put together than a lot of people your age. And that's because you've been grinding since you said like you were 12. Um, the also thing I, I, I have an issue with in, in the space right now of social media, it's like, why are we giving credibility to people who have millions of followers? Like, unless they have a, a, a working background, like Straw Hat Goofy has a tremendous marketing and advertising background. That makes sense. He's also in his 30s. But why are we giving, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old kids credibility like they've been working in this industry for 20 years? That's not the case. Like, I've been working since I was 16, 17 years old. I almost have as much experience as Matt's been alive on this planet. You know, like that, that to me is like, what do we, like, why are we, that's like apples and oranges. What are we comparing? There's a piece of toast that has millions of followers. Are we going to give the piece of toast credibility of the <laughs> industry executive who's been working for 20 years? No. Right. Right. It's, it's value set. It's how people view influencers. There's a lot of, this is a greater conversation that we'll definitely get into at some point. Cause I think it is an incredibly nuanced, interesting discussion of, of uh, you know creating false gods in our realities, and a lot of people have yeah. that. They've deified a lot of people, and it's weird. You shouldn't do it. Don't be parasocial and strange, guys. Have friends in the real world and like creators on the internet. But it's a it's a scary world we're we're living in. I'm glad that you're on the other end of this, and that we can continue too, to spin this narrative. If you guys are here listening, go look at Brad's stuff because because I think it's he is is the kind of person who will just uplift you during the day. If you scroll through your feed and you see a post by Brad Lambert, odds are you'll scroll away from that post wanting to go do something with your life for a little bit. You know, you're wanting to to get off your ass. That is my immediate impression of him. Uh, it, this podcast was because I really, really wanted to do this podcast with him. I've been wanting to do more stuff with him for years, or for, for not years, for months and months now, but I haven't been able to because of everything else. So I'm so yeah. glad to start this. But if you guys are there, show him some love, show him some support. Be there in that comment section and be his champion because he needs it right now. It's it's a difficult time to to be it. I'm currently getting canceled. I'm not kidding, guys, because I support Pride Month. So that's a new one, right? Yeah, lots of people. If you read my comment sections right now, they are a cesspool of homophobia and just people being just the worst the, the people The world ever. is so sad, man. I mean, it's it pathetic. is so sad. But you know, I appreciate you saying that, man. And, and honestly, like you know, go back years on my page. Like it's the same stuff. You know, I, I was doing similar things prior to Matt, prior to boss. You know what I mean? Like I, I've had, I had a career before them and I will have a career after them. Um, but you know, I, I wasn't made by them and they weren't made by me. We both had imp impacts on each other's careers and that's what collaborating is. Um, but you know, I, the, I, I had a conversation with my mom today and, and she, 
uh, my biggest supporter. She's the kindest person I've ever met. I mean, she would literally give you her last dime and the shirt off her back. And she's who I am today because of, of how she raised me. Um, so when people really attacked my character uh, and who I am, it was a direct attack on my mother. And, and that is something that I won't be quiet about and I will not go away quietly about. So, you know, um, I think the, the track record of what I've had, you know, a year prior to the hit piece coming out, I had a, a piece come out in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, which is my hometown, the biggest outlet over there. And it said, meet Brad Lambert, the Hollywood talent manager who makes dreams come true. And in that article, there was like four or five people who have collectively known me for almost 50 years. That's five zero. I'm 33. So that they've known Brad Lambert a long time, uh, personally and professionally. Uh, and this hit piece by The Wrap, uh, there was five individuals who've collectively known me for maybe four years. You know, I think that says a lot, you know, which is why, you know, I, I think we need to take time to understand things more before judging and jumping down people's throats uh, and canceling them. You know, it, it's it's just sad. You know, I, I feel like I have this black cloud that's going to follow me now for the foreseeable future because of the half truths that were said about me. And in reality, it was like, I don't want to live my life like that. You know, I was always raised to see the best in people and I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And I want to, you know, look at someone and, and see the best version of them and what I think that to be. But now I'm, I'm clouded with skepticism and, and fear and anxiety because, you know, frankly, I had, you know, a little brother, best friend of mine, you know, do what he did. So, you know, I, I, I always thought I had a good judge of character, but this has been a learning experience for me in many ways. But, you know, I just, if, if you have a problem with someone, talk it out, you know? Yeah. But I think society today, this is another great talking point for this podcast, is society today now, especially in the social space, is what can I use in my life to get the most clicks, the most sympathy, the most validation, and the most attention, which is why you see tons of people talk about, oh, my boyfriend cheated on me with 10 different people, blah, 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 blah. Was that necessary to put out to the world? I don't think so. But like, where is the private side of your life now? It's like, yep. you know, I, 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 there are so many things that need to be kept behind the scenes, not because they're shady or bad, but just because that that's what was normal uh, back in the day. Fortunately for me, this crap is going to exist on the internet for a long, long time. And, you know, I, it, it's, it's just so unfortunate, man, because I've done nothing but dedicate a lot of my life into helping others and trying to make the world a better place. And that's who I am. That's what my brand and it reflects it and my content and what I put out the last 10 plus years reflects that wholeheartedly. Um, and you know, it's just, uh, unfortunate, you know, what, what have you done for me lately? What can you do for me lately? And if you have a narrative that is semi-negative, Everybody comes out of the woodwork to hop on the hype train to get there five seconds. And I hope it was worth it because, you know, it just uh, it says a lot about you. It does. It does. And I can't see a better place to uh, to end this than with that. I mean, it's a it's a beautifully poignant statement. And we are in the realm that we're in, but we can make it better if we try to. Um, I'm Hassan Kader. That's Brad Lampert. Go show him some love on social media. Stay Much tuned. Subscribe that. here to see other episodes of Bad Days because we got way more coming out. I'm, I'm putting in a lot of effort on those shorts. You guys better be loving those. Uh, but yeah, I've been, I think I've already said my name. So <laughs> you're, I sincerely <laughs> hope your bad days are your best stories. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.